Hey podcast listeners, Jim Siegler here, and you're listening to Brainwaves, a podcast about neurology and medicine and all the fascinating science and history that comes with it. But you knew that already, since you chose to play an episode about CSF analysis. In the spring of 2017, I sat down with Dr. Michael Rubenstein, a general neurologist at the University of Pennsylvania. Together, we reviewed some of the basic principles to CSF testing and the lumbar puncture. Most of it's pretty straightforward, as you'd expect, so we highlighted some of the critical points that we thought you should know about regarding the cerebrospinal fluid. This week on the program, we're going to play this back for you and then give a brief update at the end. Here we go. The lumbar puncture is one of the few diagnostic tests in the neurologic armamentarium. The technical precision and accurate interpretation of cerebrospinal fluid is critical for any physician, not just neurologists. Welcome back to Brainwaves, I'm Jim Siegler. In today's episode, we'll talk about the basics of CSF interpretation, how the timing of diseases and their treatment can affect CSF results, and even how CSF findings may be misleading. We've got a lot to talk about today, so I've asked my friend Mike Rubenstein to join me and help us through all the material. Welcome back to the show, Mike. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. Mike, you're a bit of a history buff, so let's start with a bit of history. Sure. Well, the origins of lumbar puncture are sometimes debated. An internist by the name of Heinrich Quinke is often credited with its discovery. In seeing children with headaches due to hydrocephalus, Quinke longed for a technique in order to relieve this pressure, so perhaps removing the cerebral spinal fluid would be possible. But how would he accomplish this? At this time, around 1891, Quenke had been publishing on the CSF for over 20 years, so he knew the ventricles communicated with the lumbar subarachnoid space. Other physicians at the time had attempted surgical means, usually requiring spine surgery and laminectomy in order to remove CSF. But Quenke thought to introduce a small bore needle below the level of the conus medullaris in order to safely extract the fluid. Not long after the therapeutic use of the lumbar puncture, as it was called then, Quenke discovered that understanding the content of CSF could be useful diagnostically. He described methods for calculating CSF protein and glucose, cell count, and the manner for which you could identify the tuberculum bacillus in patients with meningitis. His publications would eventually earn him worldwide renown as physicians and surgeons adopted his novel technique. It's pretty cool, actually. First time somebody ever actually sampled the CSF. It's pretty amazing. And we'll certainly get to these quantitative analyses, but before we even get to them, let's talk about when it's safe to consider doing a lumbar puncture in the absence of neuroimaging. When would you want to get neuroimaging first? So we typically obtain neuroimaging on patients that have focal deficits on their examination or have evidence of mass effect with midline shift, papilledema on their examination. Also, patients greater than 60 and patients who are immunocompromised would need imaging before you do a lumbar puncture safely. CSF is produced by the choroid plexus at a rate between 450 and 500 cc's per day in the healthy adult. Given there's only enough space for about 150 cc's of CSF in the central nervous system, the arachnoid granulations must reabsorb three times the daily volume of CSF they produce. If CSF is produced too rapidly, or it's absorbed too slowly, or if there's a rapid rise in the volume of an intracranial component, like what happens during an intracerebral hemorrhage, this creates a rise in intracranial pressure. And you can measure this during a lumbar puncture. A normal intracranial pressure measured as the opening pressure once the lumbar puncture needle enters the subarachnoid space is less than 10 centimeters of water in infants, less than 15 centimeters of water in children, and less than 20 centimeters of water in adults. And while these are rough thresholds for normal, the pressure may be falsely lowered in an anxious patient who is hyperventilating. The meniscus of CSF with the manometer can also fluctuate by a few millimeters up or down with the patient's pulse, up to one centimeters with respirations, and several centimeters with coughing or valsalva. (coughs) Once you start seeing a constant pressure of over 25 centimeters of water in an adult, you should start thinking about intracranial hypertension. Or poor technique. And when the pressure rises over 40 centimeters of water, you'll need to do more than just think about it. Often, a proceduralist performing the LP should recognize the elevated ICP and attempt to remove a large volume of fluid, say 30 to 50 cc's. 
Then the proceduralist can recap the stylet and remeasure the pressure here. Once the pressure is normalized to 50% of the opening pressure, at this point we call it the closing pressure, the stylet can be removed. When you see elevated intracranial pressure, you should be thinking of things like meningitis, tumors, intracranial hemorrhage, venous sinus thrombosis, pseudotumor cerebri, and a long list of other conditions. Once you've obtained the CSF, a direct visualization can often be helpful in some cases. Obviously, if you see blood, you'll probably question whether you entered the subarachnoid space, but a pink or yellow-tinged CSF color should give you pause. And while the appearance of xanthochromia to the naked eye may suggest subarachnoid blood, you should confirm this with spectrophotometry once the cells have been centrifuged down and you're left with lots of yellow bilirubin discoloring their fluid. If the fluid is green, that can also indicate the breakdown of red blood cells, or in bacterial meningitis, a brown CSF color, while extremely rare, should concern you for meningeal melanomatosis. And I've seen that on board questions, actually. I haven't seen all about the, the green discoloration, but I have seen the brown. After you've addressed the color, turbidity and viscosity can be telling. A more turbid fluid, meaning the appearance is cloudier, indicating a large number of cells, high protein content, or even a purulence from a bacterial meningitis. You usually need more than 200 white blood cells or 400 red blood cells to make it turbid. So turbidity is non-specific, but I would say it's pretty sensitive for something that's gone wrong in the central nervous system. Or the tap may have been traumatic. And here's an important point, the traumatic tap, which occurs 10% of the time in even the most experienced proceduralists. When can you confidently say the red blood cells or the white blood cells in your CSF sample originated from incidentally damaged blood vessels, rather than from the subarachnoid space? One of the most common and probably simplest techniques is called the three-tube test, where the proceduralist counts the number of red blood cells in three consecutive tubes. If the number of red blood cells continues to fall, then it was a traumatic tap. If it does not fall or it rises or fluctuates between the tubes, you should be suspicious for a subarachnoid hemorrhage. That being said, this technique is extremely prone to error, as you can imagine a patient with a subarachnoid hemorrhage and having 25,000 RBCs in tube 1, 22,000 RBCs in tube 2, and 17,000 in tube 3, but there are still 17,000 cells in tube 3, so maybe there was a traumatic tap on top of a true subarachnoid hemorrhage. Obviously, if you see the RBCs clear to zero or near zero, that's pretty reassuring. But that's not always the case. The best method really is to rely on the presence of xanthochromia using spectrophotometry if you want to distinguish a traumatic tap from subarachnoid blood. And like spectrophotometry, which is a quantitative assay, quantitation of cell counts is extremely important. While it's okay to have a few white blood cells in the CSF, the presence of white blood cells in fluid indicates inflammation and more than 5 to 10 white blood cells per high power field is a typical laboratory threshold for what's abnormal. But the white blood cells can be falsely elevated in a traumatic tap, because there are white blood cells in your peripheral blood, right? The rule of thumb I always use is that you can have 1 WBC for every 750 to 800 RBCs in the CSF, and then you don't have to panic. Once you exceed this threshold, though, even if someone has a traumatic tap or a leukocytosis in the serum, you should still work up the patient for causes of CNS inflammation. So, for instance, a patient with 30,000 red blood cells and 100 white blood cells has an abnormally elevated number of whites in the CSF. For 30,000 red cells, you should only expect 30 to 40 white cells at the most. And depending on the total white blood cell count, it should drive you to think of one thing or another. A patient with more than 1,000 WBCs per high-powered field is most likely going to have a bacterial meningitis. Not many other conditions can do this unless you happen to incidentally penetrate an epidural abscess. 100 to 1,000 WBCs is a good range for many viral or fungal causes of meningitis, encephalitis, or myelitis. Demyelinating, autoimmune, and often inflammatory disorders typically show fewer than 100 WBCs per high-power field, but exceptions occur. A wider range of WBC values can be seen in CNS, myelomatosis, or lymphomatous meningitis, which may show just a few cells to several hundred. The differential of your white blood cells can be extremely helpful here, when the absolute numbers or clinical picture may not be. Polymorphonuclear cells are often elevated in the acute phase of both viral and bacterial meningitides in contrast to popular belief. 
and as many as 50% of taps in patients with aseptic meningitis, as we talked about in episode 41, will show a neutrophilic pleocytosis. Absolutely right. But eventually, the CSF from both viral and bacterial meningitides will evolve into a lymphocytic predominance, so that's also not always helpful. Eosinophilic meningitis is interesting and is defined by greater than 10% of eosinophils in the CSF. You've got to think about parasitic infections here, obviously, and a number of non-infectious causes may also be considered. Things like Hodgkin and non-Hodgkin lymphoma, drugs like ibuprofen and ciprofloxacin can cause aseptic eosinophilic meningitis, and lastly, the hyper-eosinophilic syndrome. Moving on to the protein, this also must be interpreted within the context of the remaining chemistries and definitely age. Neonates may have a CSF protein of 150 mg per deciliter, and it's okay. By 6 to 12 months, the range of 15 to 50 mg per deciliter becomes the norm. The CSF protein in an adult may be falsely elevated in patients with subarachnoid blood or a traumatic tap, and it can be corrected by 1 mg per deciliter for every 1,000 red blood cells. So that patient we mentioned earlier with the 30,000 red blood cells, they can have 70 mg per deciliter of CSF protein, and it may be okay. Extremely high CSF protein is very specific for bacterial, cryptococcal, and tubercular meningitis, but it's poorly sensitive. It can also be elevated, although to a lesser degree, in patients with leptomeningeal carcinomatosis. If the protein is elevated out of proportion to white blood cells, or there are no white blood cells, this albuminocytologic dissociation is very typical of the Guillain-Barre syndrome and CIDP. However, in the first week or so of GBS, Protein levels may still be normal, and a repeat tap could be helpful. I'd like to chime in here, Jim, because many physiologic factors can contribute to CSF protein derangements that med students and residents often aren't aware of. The protein may be slightly elevated based on the patient positioning alone, given there is a linear gradient of protein concentration in an upright individual resulting in higher concentrations of CSF protein to the thecal sac. The protein is greater in obese patients compared to skinny people. It's greater in patients with diabetes and kidney disease, patients with hypothyroidism, and those with spinal stenosis. In fact, the CSF protein may be extremely high, several hundred milligrams per deciliter, in patients with severe spinal stenosis resulting in spinal block, also called Freund syndrome. Tobacco users in acute alcohol intoxication may also increase the CSF protein as well. And I think it's because of the insensitivity of CSF protein in diagnostic neurologic disease that more specific tests have been developed over the nearly 100 years since Quinky first described the lumbar puncture. The IgG index, or the ratio of the CSF IgG to the CSF albumin, serves as a sensitive marker of intrathecal antibody production. While we typically think of the IgG index in patients with demyelinating disease, such as MS and NMO, You can also see it in a variety of infectious processes. Related indices such as the CSF IgA and CSF IgM values have been thought by some investigators to help distinguish infectious from non-infectious causes of intrathecal antibody synthesis. However, IgM antibodies are also observed in some cases of demyelinating disease. The identification of these antibodies in isolation within the central nervous system and not in the peripheral blood is what we call oligoclonal bands. Compared to other known indices, like the IgG index, the detection of OCBs is thought to be the most superior laboratory method for recognizing MS. And because each of these antibodies to infectious particles or to elements of the nervous system are produced within the nervous system and not the peripheral blood, OCBs do not distinguish infectious from non-infectious causes. All right, I think we've beaten the protein part of this talk to death. Let's talk quickly about the glucose and continue onward. As you know, glucose is actively transported into the CSF, so CSF glucose levels are directly related to serum concentrations. And the normal CSF glucose concentration is about 60% of the serum, but anything less than 40% or so should be considered pathologic. Hyperglycorrhachia, or elevated CSF glucose, doesn't mean very much other than that maybe your patient has diabetes. But hypoglycorrhachia, on the other hand, is concerning no matter what the cause is. Usually it indicates bacterial or tubercular meningitis or leptomeningeal carcinomatosis. Okay, 
By now, we've covered a lot of ground here about the fundamentals of CSF analysis, and we've briefly but repeatedly mentioned abnormalities of the CSF seen in infectious disease. Almost every aspect of basic CSF chemistry can lead you to finding an infectious cause. For bacterial meningitis, elevated opening pressure, extremely high white blood cell count, extremely high protein, and low glucose. But the gold standard here remains the culture. Gram stain can give you some insight into which bacterial pathogen may be likely, and usually these patients will already be on broad-spectrum antibiotics, but the culture is still required. Cultures for typical bacterial pathogens, depending on the lab, may return within hours or a few days, but cultures for acid-fast bacilli, things like tuberculosis, could take up to two weeks and often require a large volume of CSF. We also used a culture for viruses to grow the virus, but now real-time PCR can amplify specific viruses much more rapidly. It's important to distinguish here that you won't always use PCR to detect the virus in CNS diseases. In acute infections such as West Nile virus infection of the temporal lobes or deep gray nuclei, or HSV causing its hemorrhagic temporal lobe encephalitis, polymerase chain reaction is highly sensitive and specific. However, some conditions may cause a latent or even delayed consequence in the nervous system. For example, varicella zoster in elderly patients can cause a delayed vasculopathy with infarcts or aneurysm formation. According to data from Nagel and colleagues, only 30% of patients with VZV vasculopathy had positive PCRs from the CSF. Varicella IgG antibodies in the CSF proved to be a much higher yield on the order of 93%. And most centers now rely on the CSF to serum antibody ratios, which should be elevated whenever there is a CNS infection and intrathecal antibody synthesis. So in patients with suspected VZV vasculopathy, both CSF and peripheral blood need to be checked for the antibodies. Even more unusual is the diagnostic testing for enterovirus D68 in patients with acute flaccid myelitis. As you would expect, given this talk, the CSF will often be inflammatory with elevated white blood cells, usually less than 100, and protein normal or slightly up, but almost never is the enterovirus PCR positive. In 10 to 30% of cases, it can be isolated from a respiratory specimen, and in other cases, you will find it in the stool, but it's a really tricky guy to isolate. So that's what we did back in 2017, mostly stuff about CSF analysis and patients with a suspected infectious problem. What I'll add to it today are a few comments about the utility of CSF testing in other neurologic conditions. In the last decade, a number of CSF biomarkers have been proposed which correlate with neurodegenerative conditions. Alzheimer's disease is probably the best studied, and there's a large body of evidence that supports these findings that Elevated CSF tau and phosphorylated tau, and then reduced beta amyloid, which is also called A-beta-142. These biomarkers are seen in Alzheimer's disease, but they're not specific. In patients who have mild symptoms or mild cognitive impairment, beta amyloid levels may be more than 80% sensitive for Alzheimer's pathology, and it ranges from 40-70% to specific for Alzheimer's when it's compared to other neurodegenerative conditions. CSF neurofilament light chain and plasma tau levels have also correlated with Alzheimer's disease, but they vary more widely. And you might have heard of CSF neuron-specific enolase, or a few other biomarkers, which also correlate with or could eventually predict Alzheimer's disease, but these associations are less robust than what we see with beta amyloid levels and with tau and phosphorylated tau. All this being said, these biomarkers may eventually prove useful not just in providing the patient with a diagnosis, or you with some prognostic information. These markers are also being incorporated into the inclusion criteria for clinical trials that investigate novel therapeutics in early Alzheimer's disease and in other conditions like Parkinson's disease. Amyloid and tau levels may also, and I'm really meaning may here, these markers may also be useful in following the response to certain therapies since they can correlate with disease progression. But this isn't perfectly clear yet. In the Expedition 1 and Expedition 2 trials, which randomized Alzheimer's patients to solanizumab, which is a monoclonal anti-amyloid antibody, the investigators found no improvement in cognitive outcomes. But the amyloid beta-42 levels in the CSF rose significantly in the treatment arm, suggesting some sort of efficacy of the amyloid antibody. 
then there are other exciting advances in CSF analysis. Next generation sequencing, for example, has been useful in identifying occult pathogens. We're discovering more novel antibodies in autoimmune encephalitis. And there are even new insights into oligoclonal band testing for demyelinating diseases. So all kinds of changes, even with the lumbar puncture being such an old technique. And I think that we've got even more to look forward to. That wraps up for the show this week. Thanks so much for joining us. I hope you learned something new on the program, even if you might have listened to the episode before. And if you're enjoying the show, let us know by rating it on iTunes, Stitcher, Acast, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also subscribe to Brainwaves on YouTube or Spotify, or follow us on Twitter at Brainwaves Audio. The Brainwaves podcast is produced out of Studio 3 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I'm Jim Siegler, the senior producer. I'd like to thank Dr. Mike Rubenstein for co-writing the show this week and Steve Combs for the music. Coming up in the next few weeks, we've got some great shows about sleep-related movement disorders, things that you should know about gadolinium, and bias in the medical literature with Ali Hamadani. Stay tuned for that. I'm Jim Sigler for Brainwaves, and I'll talk to you soon.